Bible, we want you to uh, take one of our sanctuary Bibles. My goodness. And if you have your Bible, I want you to look at uh, Luke, the 10th chapter, 38th verse. We're going to look at a message. You know, I don't think I've ever preached this message before. I've talked on different aspects and things, but there's something here I really believe is a word for us today. I think there's a, it's a simple message, but it is such a life-changing message that God has for us today. In the name of the message that I've entitled today is just Martha, Martha. And most of you, if you're familiar with the Bible, you know who Martha in the Bible is. Martha and Mary. And it's an interesting uh, story because when Jesus was passing through, he ended up staying in Bethany at the house of Martha and Mary and their brother Lazarus. And there's some interesting things that I, I found as I was looking at this, and it really became alive to me today. First thing I want us to look at, I think that all of us not only have dealt with, but deal with on a constant basis, is the idea of being distracted. Have you ever been distracted? Have you ever just kind of, you know, you, you're there, but you're not really there? Kind of, I know when I was in school, I was never there, but I was always present. You know what I'm saying? It's one of those things where you just don't have to be there. Uh, you can be there physically, but maybe not the rest. And so uh, what I want to focus on is, is a verse where Jesus said, only one thing is needed. He ended up telling Martha, there's only one thing that is needed. And we're going to look at what that one thing is today. And uh, in verse 38, we look at letter A. Martha knew Jesus. Let me go ahead and read that verse. It says this, that as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Now I want to tell you, just about any message you hear on Martha, it's always the negative side of Martha. You know, always busy, always working, but, you know, it's kind of gets that negative rep. And, and there's part of that. I think all of us, you know, deal with that from time to time. But Martha had become acquainted with Jesus. We don't know if this was her first encounter. Maybe she had met him uh, out in his different ministries, but she became acquainted with Jesus. She got to know him. And Martha, she, she, she knew him well, well enough to invite him to her home. Now, Martha is one of those type A personalities. She is bold. She is outgoing. And I want to tell you, we all need a little of that in our spirits. We, actually, we need a lot of that in our spirit. When it comes to our relationship with God, you see, God always beckons us to draw near to Him. It says in Matthew 7, Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. The one who knocks, the door shall be opened up to him. God is saying, come and ask of me. Come and seek me. Come and knock to find me. God is not wanting us to be timid to come into his presence. Why is that? Because we are his children. His children don't need to be timid in the presence of their heavenly father. You know, when I was growing up, my dad, for those of you who knew him, uh, you didn't know him the way I knew him. I mean, he was, he was bigger and larger than life. You know, a farmer, he had these hands. I mean, he just grip you. It was like Bam Bam on the Flintstones, you know. It was one of those things. And um, 
I mean, people were genuinely afraid of my dad. Now, he was as de gentle as a, a teddy bear, but, I mean, he's just one of those old Italian type, you know, very stoic and uh, one of those type of people. But I was, I was one of his six children, the smallest one, and uh, I wasn't afraid of my dad. And I remember there was this one time when I was a little kid. I must have been six or something. And I, we're going way back, you know, memory lane here, especially in uh, old South Florida. There was a place down at Angel Beach. It was called Pirate's World. I don't know if any of you ever heard of Pirate's World. Yeah, but that was, I mean, that was in walking distance from our house. And at Pirate's World, and they mercifully shut it down. It was full of drugs and all kinds of stuff going on. But these kids, you know, they had all the games and the things. And uh, they used to do the championship wrestling there. And, um, oh, I was, I was into wrestling, you know, at six, seven years of age. And so uh, one of my friends was going to go there. I guess his parents or something were going to tell And I just begged my dad uh, constantly, can I go? I want to go see the wrestling. I mean, and he said, no, no, no. Finally, after a while... He looked at me, and he gave me that look, and he said, no. He got, he got fed up with it. I got the message. But, uh, you know, I was not afraid to approach my dad. I was not afraid to ask him. As God's children, we don't need to be afraid to come into the presence of the Lord. Whatever we need, we can ask him. We can at least ask. You know, that's what Martha did. Out of all the people that Jesus went and spent the day with, the night with, Martha actually got to be privileged to have them. A lot of people probably didn't ask Jesus because they were too timid. They were too afraid. She wasn't. She asked. And as a matter of fact, this whole story takes place because she asked. And so she asks, and Jesus comes and stays with them. And so we need more of that Martha, the men and the women. We need to have more of that spirit who are strong and not easily put off. This is what it says in Hebrews 4.16. It says, let us therefore come boldly. Isn't that? God's saying, come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And so what happens to most of us is that we get beat down by the enemy. You know, you're just bothering God. Anybody ever said that? I, you know, I don't want to bother God. Wait, you don't bother God. God. There's nowhere in the scripture that you're going to find that, oh, you know, you're bothering me. Don't come. Every scripture says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Ask, seek, find. Come boldly unto the throne of grace. He is always asking us to come. He's never telling us, I'm too busy to hear your prayers. I got all these things going on in the universe, six billion people, please, you know, uh, you know, so we don't want to bring all our little requests before God. That's not in the Bible. That's not scriptural. We're supposed to bring everything, the Bible says, with prayer and petition. We can, we're not, we're not bugging God. God loves us and he wants us to come before him. And I think it is the enemy, first of all, is just trying to keep us out of the presence of God. Because if he can keep us out of the presence of God, then he can do his work. And so, Martha comes, she asks boldly, confidently, Jesus comes. And this story, this account, doesn't happen unless Martha takes the initiative. And there will be a time, and probably frequently, that you need to enter into that throne room of grace. Not long after this, the story of Martha and Mary, they would need Jesus' help. In John 11, it talks about the story of their brother Lazarus, who would die. And he'd be in the tomb for four days. And they needed Jesus. And they had called for Jesus to come to get there before he died, but he wasn't there in time as far as their timetable went. And they were sorrowful. And so Jesus is coming back, and it says this, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming. She went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. You give Martha a bad rap a lot of times. It was Martha who met Jesus the first time, came to the house. It was Martha who went out and met Jesus when her sister Mary, maybe she was discouraged, maybe she was so broken hearted, even though she knew Jesus was out there, she stayed home. A lot of us, we get so discouraged, we just 
stay home physically or in our spirit. And we don't go, well, that's when we need to be in the presence of God the most. And so Martha goes for the second time. And this miracle that would take place of la raising Lazarus from the dead would have taken place if Martha again hadn't taken the initiative. So boldly, confidently, we can draw near to God. In Jeremiah 33.3 it says this, Call unto me and I will answer thee. God is always beckoning us to draw near to Him. Seek me and you shall find me when you search for me with your whole heart, it says in Jeremiah. In Hebrews, it says this, that God is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And so there's no exceptions to God's calling for our lives. Well, you know, and, and with me... If somebody calls me you know, and I don't return that call and they call me a second time, I mean, I feel like I have sinned. I feel I've, I've missed it somewhere. I mean, I don't want somebody to have to be calling me several times before I'm going to respond. And, unless it's a telemarketer. And, you know, I kind of put them off a little bit. You know, but if somebody is calling me, I feel bad if I don't return their calls promptly. How does God feel when you call Him? Is it the tenth time before he's going to answer? He's going to answer immediately. He's going to respond to your faith immediately. You know, God is not pushing you off. God is wanting to draw you in. And that's what Martha brings to the table. But let's go ahead and read on. Martha was distracted by all the preparations. So in verse 38, let's start there again. It says, As Jesus and his disciples went on their way, he came to the village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he had to say. But Martha was distracted. You can circle that word distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. This may be, I think, the greatest battle that we face is that we get distracted by all the preparations that we feel like have to be made because of all the things that, that happens stems from us just being in the presence of God. He says in verse 41, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. Out of all the people in all the places Jesus could have gone, he chose to go to Martha's home. 99% of all the people never had Jesus when he was here on earth come to their home, but he came to Martha's home. And the question is, what did she do with that time that she had with Jesus? Was it time well spent? Jesus' visit to earth was a time like no other time here on earth in human history. How is Martha using this time? Can you imagine the first thing is she's distracted because of all these other peripheral things that need to take place. And she is worried and upset. You know, she's doing all this work. She thinks I got to do all this stuff to get ready for Jesus. And then she looks over and there's her sister as she's running around just sitting at Jesus' feet. And now she's angry at her sister. And she's wanting Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, to command her to come and help her because she is angry, she's upset, she's stressed out because of all these visitors that are going to be coming here and Jesus is there. And all of a sudden, when she's in the physical presence of Jesus, how is she? She's distracted. She's worried. She's upset. Is that a parable for our lives? 
Christ is with us in the Holy Spirit 24-7. How much time do we spend being distracted, being worried, being upset, being anxious over all the things that are going on? Listen, when that happens, you need to know something's not right. When that happens to me, after a while, I catch myself and I say, something is not right. Why am I anxious? Why am I upset? Why am I going through all this turmoil inside? It is the Lord, the Holy Spirit, trying to tell us, listen, you're not balanced. You're not walking in the peace. You're not walking in the joy. You need to take a breath. You need to stop. You need to reevaluate what's going on right now in the midst of this. Jesus never lost his peace. He was never anxious. He never worried. He was teaching his disciples that they could be like him. They could walk in this peace. They could walk in this joy. Mary was, but even though Jesus was physically present in her house, in the midst of all of that, she was worried. She was anxious. She was upset inside. Let me tell you, that can happen and that does happen to all of his children because we're not walking in the Spirit. God is trying to communicate something to us. It's not your circumstances that are causing you to be upset. It's something greater than that. It's something that's going on on the inside of your heart, in the inside of your life. And the Lord is just kind of stay, you know, standing back waiting for you to do what he's already told you to do. To ask, to seek, to knock, to draw near to him, to call upon him so that he'll answer you and then he'll come and he'll give you that peace. If Martha wasn't distracted and not worried and upset, you know, she had to get focused on what she needed to do. That's what we need to do. We need to not be distracted, but we need to be focused to get our heart and our mind. And that's what the enemy tries to do. He tries to distract us, cause us to get worried, tries to get upset, all these things that are going on. There's a story, I don't know if I ever shared this one with you, but well, about 10 years or longer than 10 years ago, we were living in Lake Park. We had a house and we bought this house and in the back of this house, our last two houses we bought had ficus trees. I don't know what our next house is going to be, but if it has a ficus tree, we're not buying it. I mean, if you know what a ficus tree is. These are the big, I mean, they're monsters. And they got roots. And the roots were uh, getting into our, our bathtub, getting into our plumbing and all that stuff. And um, it was getting started, it was messing up the foundation because they're big and they run along the surface. And uh, that tree, it was in our backyard. It was in a weird spot. It was between power lines. And I mean, it, it was a massive, massive tree. And uh, I called a couple people in to give me a, a quote on bringing it down. You know, one guy quoted me $1,000. The next tree guy, he wouldn't even do it because of the power lines. And, um, you know, so I told my wife, hey, I'll cut it down myself. And she said, no, you won't. And uh, so she was going on a trip to... Uh, uh, Texas for about two weeks and uh, so I waved goodbye as she took the kids away and as soon as she drove away I ran and I got to, went to Home Depot I got a big chainsaw and I thought you know for a couple hundred bucks I can get a chainsaw and uh, I'm gonna take that I'm gonna take that sucker down and so uh, <clears throat> now when I was a kid you know we were kind of like you know Tom Sawyer Robin you know the Huckleberry fan. We used to climb trees. We had tree forts. Um, you know, we, we would go out into the woods. And um, so it was nothing for me to go climb up and around trees. And I was a lot younger and dumber then. And uh, I thought, well, I'm going to go up there. I'm going to cut this tree down. And uh, I would, I mean, now, the, now these big branches, uh, and they were way up there. I, I remember getting up about 15, at least 15 feet above the roof. Uh, up there and I had made these like little perches so I could get up there because you have to cut the uh, tree you know from the top coming down and you got to put them in sections I don't know if I took the power line out once but uh, uh, I'm cutting these branches but the thing was that I knew 
I mean, you know, th this was what I was going to do. I mean, I, it wasn't that smart, but uh, like I said, I was young and dumb, and I didn't have any money, and uh, we needed to take that tree down. And so when I turned that power saw, uh, that chainsaw on, I remembered that in my mind, I had premeditated, I was focused, I was expecting some kickback, I was expecting maybe the branch to swing, and I was, gonna, I was determined that I was going to stay focused no matter what happened, because I didn't want that chainsaw to come down and to hit me. And so, uh, you know, I'm up there, and I uh, built a little stand so I could get up there and cut all these branches, and we had a friend of ours who had a dump truck. I don't know how many dump truck loads I took out, and I didn't realize, it was just kind of an epiphany when I was uh, up there, and I looked down, I'm about 20 feet over the uh, housetop, and I see uh, my neighbors, they were all just there, they were having entertainment, they were all, I mean, all of them were in the backyards looking at me, you know, cutting this thing down, so I kind of figured, oh, I guess they don't think this is normal. So, but anyhow, I was focused, I was determined that I wasn't going to allow myself to be distracted. And I want to tell you, in the spiritual realm, that's what we have to do. We have to be focused. We cannot be distracted by the things of the world. And when we find ourselves being anxious, when we find ourselves being upset, then you know that you are distracted. Because Jesus is right there, and she is just as anxious, she is just as upset as she would have been if Jesus wasn't there. And so there is a story there for us that we need to enter in to his presence. Determine that you won't be distracted, first of all. Secondly, determine to make the most of your opportunity. Martha had an incredible opportunity setting there before her in all of human history to have Jesus there in the flesh. And she was letting this opportunity slide by. Because she was worried about the dishes. She was worried about the guests. She was, whatever she was worried about was over here and she's missing this golden opportunity over there. Do not let those opportunities slide by. We need to focus our devotion upon Christ. Let's look at the second point here. Our devotion. Mary had chosen what is better. And starting here in verse 39 again, it said that she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he had to say. She was like a dry sponge that was soaking in every word, drinking every word up. Can you see this picture of this sponge just soaking in every word that was coming from the mouth of the Lord? And she was not going to get up before the Lord was done. She was not going to go do this, that, and the other. This was her time. She had determined to be there. She was soaking this up. And then finally, her sister comes in and tells him, Hey, command her to come and help me and be worried and anxious and upset just like I am. He said, No, no. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. There's only one thing that is needed. Mary has chosen. I want you to circle that word, chosen, what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. You see what it says there? It says it was, she had chose to be there. Martha had a choice to make, and she chose not to be there in her spirit. I come into the presence of God simply to be in the presence of God. When you are in His presence, there is fullness of joy. You come just to meet with God. Everything else is going to be taken care of as you are in His presence. And a lot of times, that's the one thing that we never really get around to, is just simply being in His presence. It says in Psalms 46.10, to be still and know 
that I am God. Everything else flows from that. God can do more in seconds than we can do in a lifetime. In a lifetime. Think about all that God can do in your life that you have absolutely no power to do on your own. This is one of those instances where less is more. Think about Jesus. He was only on earth as far as his earthly ministry for three and a half years. He didn't write any books. He didn't travel more than 20 miles from wherever he went. He walked everywhere that he went. He had zero political power, ambition, or game. He wasn't in the who's who. He wasn't rich on what we would call the earthly uh, standards. And there's got to be a message there somewhere for us. If that's the way Jesus lived his life and he turned the whole world upside down, there must be a message in there for us somewhere. And you say, well, that's, of course, that's Jesus. I mean, you know, Jesus does that, but we're not, we're not Jesus. I want you to turn back a couple chapters to chapter 9 of Luke. I want you to read what he told his disciples as he was getting ready to send them out on their first solo mission. He was preparing them for ministry. And when Jesus called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he told them, now listen to what he tells them. He says, take nothing for your journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Can you imagine? He says just, I want you to go out there. You got money, leave it at home. You got a suitcase full of clothes, leave it at home. Don't take all this stuff with you. Why would he send them out with nothing? Because he wanted them to know that he, his father, was their source. It wasn't the money in their wallet. It wasn't the clothes in their wardrobe. It wasn't any of the uh, things that we lean on, hope on, trust on. He said, you just trust in me, and I'm going to take care of all of your needs while you're out there doing my work, doing my ministry. You remember that time when Jesus was being criticized? They criticized uh, uh, Peter and told him, you know, why doesn't your master pay the temple tax? You know, he's a freeloader. He's not paying the tax. And of course, Jesus told him he's, he, he wasn't there, but he knew the conversation. And he asked Peter, he said, hey, Peter, do the uh, sons of the king have to pay the taxes or are they collected by the servants? Is, are the sons exempt? Yeah, well, the sons are exempt. So he could have justified himself and walked away. But he says, but not to offend them. Tell you what I want you to do, Peter. Get your fishing pole. Go out and cast your pole in the very first fish that you catch. Not the second, not the third. You're going to find a $20 gold piece. Enough for my tax and your tax in the mouth of that fish. Now imagine that. He's going to throw that out. He's going to hook that fish. And that fish is going to come up with his gold piece in his mouth. And he says, with that, you pay your tax and my tax. Couldn't Jesus have just said, go to our treasury, take out the money, pay the taxes so we don't offend them? Why does he do this miracle? First of all, he does the miracle to satisfy the Pharisees, but more importantly, and the real reason was, he was going to show Peter, listen, you don't have to worry about all the things that everybody else is running after. You don't have to worry about where the money is going to come from. You don't have to worry about where all the other things come from. If you are seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, it's all going to be taken care of for you. So as soon as you pull that fish out, you open its mouth, and what are you going to find there? I want to tell you, when you see miracles like that begin to happen, what does it do to your stress? What does it do to your worry? What does it do to your anxiety? And God, is He not the same yesterday, today, and forever? Doesn't God work the same way in our lives? Or He wants to work the same way in our lives and to do those same things. When we got ready to 
start Church in the Glades. I don't know if I told this story either, so you're getting some new uh, stories if I hadn't told them before. But um, I, I told you the story about how we found this place, but when, uh, when we were getting ready to start Church in the Glades, um, you know, I didn't get all the education and find out you're not supposed to start it the way we started it. I mean, we started out with nothing. I mean, literally, uh, me and my parents and uh, uh, some family members, um, you know, in the living room, we're getting ready to start this. And uh, I went and I talked to a guy by the name of John Fleming, who was a part of Gulfstream. And we were going to start the church regardless, because I believe that God was telling us that this is what we're supposed to do. And so, uh, but... Um, you know, he's part of Gulfstream Baptist, and I figured they probably know more than I do. So uh, I'm going to ask them and tell them, sh share with them my vision. And uh, at that time, we were praying about where we were going to start the church. We had no idea in Broward County where God wanted us to start the church. And um, long story short, he led us to southwest Broward County. And uh, so we were going to start it there. And in one of those meetings, and this is 10 years ago. Now, they had started many churches, Southern Baptist churches out in this area before and since. And uh, in one of those meetings, he said to me, there was a church that started, I think it was like five or six years before. Now, remember, there were other churches that had tried to plant out in this area. And he said they had started a building fund. They had raised $10,000. They didn't make it. And uh, the pastor said, I'm giving you this money, but earmark it for another church that's going to start in this area. And he just stopped and he looked at me and he says, we got $10,000 here and I'm supposed to give it to you. I said, thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because God knows what we need. I didn't know there was $10,000 sitting there with our name on it, earmarked for us. He gives us that money, and uh, three weeks after this building opened up, we couldn't find a place, and God led us here, and we walk in there, and I told you the story about Alma and uh, the little yellow, yellow stick. I said, is this place available to rent? And she says, well, let me open up the registrar's book, and there it was. Hold for a church. Are you guys at church? Uh, yes. <laughs> she said, it's available. You can have it. We rented it. And it all came in God's timing, God's plan, and God's purpose. You see, God is the source. He is the one who supplies all of our needs according to his riches and glory. And so when we become anxious and we become worried about where the bills are going to be paid from, where the, you know, it's all going to take place, we need to be able to be like Mary. We need to be able to just rest. We need to be able to abide. We need to be able to wait on Him, trust in Him. And that God, who was able to part the Red Sea, who was able to feed the 5,000, who was able to give Peter that fish with a gold coin, who was able to raise the dead, that God is able to take care of our needs according to his riches and glory. So he tells his disciples, you go out there, don't bring anything with you, and it's all going to be taken care of for you. And so it was, and they were taken uh, care of. And so in verse 42, he told Martha, he said, she has chosen the better, and it will not be taken away from her. So Mary and Martha both had the same opportunity. God did not force either one. You know, God is very laid back in His relationship with you. He is looking for those who are hungry and thirsty in their hearts. He's not going to force Himself upon you. He is asking you to seek Him to draw near to Him so that He might be able to bless you, be able to touch your life. Jesus doesn't condemn. He didn't look down or belittle Martha. All He said to her was this in verse 42. He said, But only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better. You've made your choice, but she made a choice that was better. And that is not going to be taken from her. Now Martha, I want you to know, is a worshiper. 
Now, you say, no, no, Mary's the worshiper. No, Martha is a worshiper. And Mary is a worker. They both go hand in hand. It's not mutually exclusive. If you are worshiping, you will work. If you are in the presence of God, it's going to manifest itself. God loved Martha. Jesus loved Martha just as much as he loved Mary and Lazarus and everybody else. And how do I know that Mary was a worshiper? Well, in John 11:5, it says this. It says that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Specifically points out Martha. He loved Martha. He loved his sister. He loved Lazarus. Martha is Jesus' daughter. He is Jesus' sister. He is Jesus, part of the bride of Christ. Martha is one of Jesus' chosen people. Just like everyone in this room that names the name of Christ, that asks Christ to come in their life, we are His children, brother, sister, part of that bride of Christ. And so, the work and the worship, it goes hand in hand. If you remember back in Genesis, when God created man, it says this, that the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. You see, work is not a bad thing. Work is not something that we're trying to avoid. Work is part of the purpose of God. So as we are worshiping, God begins to bless us to be able to work to fulfill the purposes and the plans that God has for us. If so some of you are familiar with Brother Lawrence. He was a monk that lived hundreds of years ago. And uh, all the other monks of higher rank and status, they got to go and transcribe the scriptures and meditate and pray and spend all their time. And uh, Brother Lawrence got relegated to washing pots and pans. And so instead of feeling sorry for himself, he said, you know what? I'm going to worship God as I clean the pots and pans. I'm going to be the best uh, kitchen cleaner uh, that there ever was in this monastery. And as he was washing pots and pans, God began to give him revelation because he was worshiping God, not just washing pots and pans. You know what I'm saying? You can worship God at work. You can worship God 24-7 because the Holy Spirit is living inside of His children. And as you're in His presence, He'll begin to give you revelation. I mean, I'll tell you, I got more revelation driving my produce truck uh, than I ever did almost any, any other place. Because as you're in that presence, you don't have to worry. You don't have to be anxious. You don't have to be upset. God wants to be with us. Let's look at the last point. It says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. What is it about Mary that makes her life stand out? She worships in a way that is so pure in heart. And there's something about the way that her heart just worships before God. Martha was trying to enter into Jesus' presence, but Mary, but she was distracted, but Mary was in the presence of God. You know, she was there, she was focused as she was sitting at Jesus' feet. You know, she was like what they call in sports. She was in the zone. You ever get those people that are in the zone? If you were old enough to watch Michael Jordan, man, he was in the zone. There were certain points of the game. Once he got in the zone, it uh, didn't matter what the other three quarters were like. I mean, it was all over. He would go and just take over the game. And there was another guy by the name of James who was in the zone there. there. But Michael Jordan, he is in the zone. You get people like that in the spirit, you can get in the zone. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it just lifts you, it blesses you, you can conquer kingdoms. There's nothing that can uh, keep you down because the Spirit of God is upon you. Being in the zone. Mary was in the zone. And as long as Satan can keep you distracted, he can keep you defeated. 
If you're feeling defeated, it's probably because first you were distracted. And once you're distracted, then comes the worry, then comes the anxiousness, then comes upset, then becomes all the problems just begin to pile upon you. Jesus' presence. You are there, but you're really not there. People can be in the service, but not really be there. But if you are there and you are in the presence, there is the Spirit of God just lifting all your burdens off your shoulders. You know, Robin Williams, he had a little joke. He said, if you're old enough and you can remember the 60s, if you can remember the 60s, he said you probably weren't really there. And, uh, you know, the idea is that if you are really there, you are really in the presence of God, something special is happening in your heart. People can sense it. People can feel it. People are drawn to it. There is only one thing that you and I have to offer other people of real value. There's only one thing. And that is the presence of God. When you've got the presence and the Spirit of God, other people, they sense it. They feel it. They are drawn to it. That's why Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. When people are walking in the Spirit, they want what you got. They want that peace. They want that joy. They want that life. That joy unspeakable and full of glory. And they say, where can I get that? That's how Christ lifts himself up, lifts up the body by his presence living inside of us. I want to look at one more scripture and we're going to uh, close here. In John 12, 2 and 3, I want to look at the time that Mary anointed Jesus' feet. And it says this, I want to start in verse 2. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served. Now I want you to know the notice here. Martha served, but she was worshiping as she served. It didn't say that she was distracted like the time before. It didn't say that she was anxious like the time before. It didn't say that she was upset like the time before. She served because she was worshiping. She was in His presence. She was experiencing the presence of God and Martha served while Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead, was among those reclining at the table with him. That kind of changed her heart, changed her focus as she saw her brother, who had been raised from the dead. You know what? After seeing that, I don't have to worry about a whole bunch. I don't have to worry about dying. I don't have to worry about all the provisions. I don't have to worry about a whole lot. She was gladly, joyfully serving. And here is Mary... It says, Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. Now that, in the other Gospels, it says that it was worth a year's wage. Can you imagine? If you made sixty or $70,000 last year, it was a year's wage. And she poured it on Jesus' feet. I mean, we're talking about an event that would take three or four minutes and she's pouring out all of this on Jesus' feet. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with a fragrance of perfume. She was worshiping and she was not distracted. All the other people that were around were murmuring and complaining, but Mary was in the zone. She was worshiping. She didn't care what anybody else thought around her because she was in the presence of her Lord and her Savior. And she was at peace. And Jesus said this in Mark 14, 9, one of the other accounts of this event. He said, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. I thought that was interesting when I read that this morning. In memory of her. Not in memory of me, but in memory of Mary. I want to tell you, there is only one thing 
that you can do in your life that will be remembered for all eternity. Nothing else will be remembered except what is done through worship. Your whole life comes down to your relationship with God, your worship of Him. She was worshiping her Lord and Savior. People thought it was a waste to drop sixty, seventy thousand dollars in today's wage on His feet. And He said, no, no, no. Wherever in the whole world, for all eternity, the Gospel is preached. And it's kind of interesting, in the four Gospels, this is one of the few stories that is recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When the Gospel is preached, that story is there because she was a worshiper. Listen, there's only one thing in your life that's needed, first and foremost. And that is your relationship with God. Forget the other problems. They will eventually take care of themselves. God will lift you up. God will lift you past the mire and all the heartaches and the things that you're going through that seem so important right now. Because it's all temporary and He knows what you need. But if you'll worship Him and seek Him first, He's going to provide everything else that you need. Amen? Let's go ahead and stand together. We're going to close in prayer. And if you have a need in your life, listen, all of us have been there. All of us have been distracted at one time or another. There's a good chance that just about everyone, including the guy behind the pulpit, was distracted this week by different things. And to be reminded that, Lord, if I just come into your presence, there's fullness of joy. Lord, all my problems I can lay at your feet and I can worship you. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. You can come into His presence right now. You can come and know Him as Lord and Savior. If you're like Martha, and you've been distracted, you know Him as your Lord and Savior, but there's anxiety and worry and you just can't get past it. And I ask you, if you need prayer, to come forward. Because God will hear and God will answer.